Welcome to the Milker Government Channel. I'm Judy Zelina. The Highmark Caring Place, a center for grieving children, adolescents, and their families, champions the cause of grieving children by creating awareness of their needs, providing programs for them and their families, and empowering the community to effectively support them. We are very fortunate today to have on our show the executive director of the Highmark Caring Place, Therese Vorshek. Therese has been on the program before, but it's been a while. It has been it? a while, Judy. I appreciate you inviting me back. Uh, you know why? The reason I like having you on this program is you always have some great information, uh, great programs going. And also, there's a lot of our viewers that don't even know that you're here right in our own backyard. That is true and unfortunate. I guess um, with the type of work that we do, mm -hmm. that people don't, don't know that we're out here until and they might unfortunately need us. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Which brings me to the first question. What exactly is the Highmark Caring Place? So at the Highmark Caring Place, what we provide is support for children and their family members who have had a family member die. So when a, you know, when a child has a parent or a sibling or a grandparent who has died for a, for a, under a variety of circumstances, they need some extra support. It's very difficult for them. Many, many things in their lives change. And so our programming provides that support for them. Why is a program like this needed? I mean, you hear people say, oh, they're kids, they'll get over it, you know, mm -hmm. the, you know they'll roll with it, uh, they'll be out playing baseball before you even know it. Absolutely, and that's what we hear all the time. Exactly. Kids are resilient, mm -hmm. right? That, we say that about kids for a variety of Constantly. reasons. Constantly. And they'll bounce back, they'll get over it, you know, give them a couple of weeks and they'll be fine. And nothing could be further from the truth, to be honest. Um, these kids who, when somebody they love dies, really, honestly, their lives are turned upside down. They, um, so many things change in addition to having somebody they love no longer with them. So if you can imagine being a 10 year old child whose mother died um, and all of a sudden mom's not there in the morning to get you up and, and get you ready for school or to when you get home at night to help you with your homework and all the hundred, hundreds of things that mothers do on a day to day basis for their child to nurture, to help you grow up, to guide you. All of a sudden, she's not there, and you love her. And of course, you know that the sadness of missing mom or the the, per, the person who died is is very real and very big. But in addition to that, and what a lot of people don't understand is, oftentimes, the death is really just the beginning of a lot of changes that happen for that child. So if um, if a parent dies or a sibling. Lots of things change in the family. You know, the whole family dynamic changes. Um, you know, if, if a parent dies, then the surviving parent's now a single parent. And that changes a lot of things in the, in the family. Sometimes financial situations may change because of that, which may mean that the family has to move, which means the child has to change schools. And change, the, you know, their friends change, their neighborhood change, everything changes for them. So oftentimes it's a domino effect of a lot of, a lot of stressors for them. I never thought about that. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm thinking of them just dealing with the grief of that, the loss of their loved one. Mm -hmm. But so much comes into play. Um, as, you're, as you're talking about this, like getting up for breakfast and mom or dad or grandma or grandpa isn't there anymore. Mm -hmm. It's funny because I think these kids think that they have to be strong, mm -hmm. you know, and the spouse that's left is dealing with their own right. grief. And they look at the kids, the kids are pouring their milk, and so they're doing okay, but they don't realize what's going on inside. Absolutely, and, and that's part of the reason why, again, the kids need some extra support in a program like ours, because not only are the kids grieving, obviously the adults in their lives are grieving, and those are the people they would typically turn to mm -hmm. when something difficult is happening in their lives. And th those uh, the adults are grieving as well. And while they're doing as best as they can to take care of their children, right. They've just had a significant loss as well. And right. so it's, it's a very difficult time for the entire family. So at the Caring Place, what we do is we bring these families together. We bring the kids together with other kids who unfortunately have lost somebody themselves. And we provide uh, a safe environment for them to, to be with one another and talk with one another and support each other 
again, because they understand what each other is going through because they're going through it as well. And the adults have their own support groups at the Caring Place as well, so it's not just about the kids, the adults can get, um, can get extra support as well. So it's a family type of community? It is at the Caring Place. It is. Our focus is really on children's grief right. because we're really trying to help people understand just what we started at the, uh, the top of the show with that kids don't just bounce back from this necessarily. They do need some extra help and, um, and so the focus is on raising awareness around that but our program is a family program. And I think too the kids are afraid to say anything about it because they don't want to make mom or dad cry or be sad. Absolutely. We hear that from the kids that come to our program. Oh, I believe it. A lot. That they're, they, exactly what you just said, mom's crying, dad's crying, their siblings are, you know, they're upset, they're crying. So maybe they would typically turn to a bigger sister or a big brother. They're grieving as well. Right. And so everybody's trying to deal with the grief in their own way and protect everybody else in the family. Now, how do people f find out about it? Okay, uh, someone's lost a loved one. How do people find out that you're there and you, that you offer this service? Sure. So we do a lot of outreach into the community, and we, we especially work a lot with the schools in the Erie community and, and surrounding um, in, the, in Erie County. Um, but we also do a lot of, we talk to a lot of different groups and professionals in the, in the community that can um, hopefully spread the word about, um, about the programs that we do. And all a family has to do is give us a call and we can walk them through the process. We also have a, um, a very robust website online, the uh, highmarkcaringplace.com. Mm -hmm. And in addition to our contact information being on there, there's also a lot of information on there for families who may be in these types of circumstances. Now, how long has um, the, the Highmark Caring Place been around uh, all together and how long has it been here in Erie? Sure, so we started actually in Pittsburgh in 1996 and um, we came to Erie in 2001. So actually this year we'll be celebrating our 15th anniversary. 15 years you've yes, been here. believe it or not. Mm -hmm. Where did the, the idea come from uh, in 96 down in Pittsburgh? So what happened was, um, so the Caring Place is a program of the Caring Foundation and the Caring Foundation has its roots again in Pittsburgh. The foundation itself started in 1985 mm -hmm. and um, it was actually under the foundation that the first program for children, um, uninsured children was created. The model for what is now known as the Children's Health Insurance Program. Okay. That all model right. was created under these, um, oh, all right. the Caring Foundation as well. And so uh, the executive director of the Caring Foundation at the time, he was working on those programs. And unfortunately, his professional and personal life collided as sometimes happens. And he had a death in his family. His stepson was killed in an accident. And he had his uh, six-year-old son at home who was grieving the death of his big brother. Mm -hmm. And so his family turned to the community to look for a program for his son and realized there really wasn't anything out there for kids. There was programs for adults, um, but really nothing that focused on the grief of children. So that's how um, the idea came to be and, and it grew from there. I think it's wonderful. Now, these children, I wanted to ask, they're, they're going to uh, come to the Caring Place. Do you provide counseling? Actually, it's not counseling that we provide. Okay. That's, that's a great question because there is a difference. What we're providing is peer support. Mm -hmm. So we're bringing the kids together with other grieving kids and the families, the grieving families together with other grieving families um, who help support one another. And we're a volunteer-based program. And so it's actually trained volunteers. We, we train them, but it's actually the trained volunteers who are working directly with the families. So it's not trained professional counselors who are working with the kids. It, it's not individual therapy. Everything we do is in groups. Mm -hmm. And it's volunteers who are facilitating a variety of discussions and activities with the kids and the family. So it's peer support. It's not counseling or okay. therapy. Now, how would a, a parent or an adult know that a child would benefit from this program? That's a really good question. And we get calls about that a lot. So we'll, um, an adult will call and say, I think my child is doing okay, mm -hmm. but I'm right. not sure. You know, they're, they're going to school. Uh, I'm just not really sure, but they're not really talking about, let's say it was their brother that died. They're right. not talking about him. So I'm just not really sure. And, and a lot of times what we'll say to, to families is that even if the child isn't showing overt signs, 
such as, um, you know, some children will react a little bit more um, obviously to the grief and, and their grades at school will drop. Okay. They might um, be, begin to isolate themselves. They'll stay home a little bit more. They don't want to go out with their friends anymore. Um, maybe they're not eating as well. They're, they might be having sleep difficulties. So sometimes it's pretty obvious okay. that the kids are are struggling, but even if those overt signs aren't, aren't present, oftentimes what I'll say to families is, you know what, even if it's not obvious looking at them, right. they something really significant and, and negative has happened in their lives. They Grieving is a natural process, and they are grieving whether you can tell it, tell it or not, mm -hmm. because that is a natural response to a death. So whether you can see them grieving or not, they are grieving, and sometimes the grief is enough. You don't have to have those out, outward signs, but the grief is enough to say, yeah, I need some support. Um, and so what we do is we have the families come to the program for what we call an orientation, and that gives the kids an opportunity and the adults to kind of check us out, see what we do, and the kids can, can make the, the decision whether or not they think that they might benefit from something like That's what we're what providing. That's what I wanted to ask you. If I walk in your door for the first time mm -hmm. and you're located here in Erie, what is the address? It's 510 Cranberry Street. Okay. We're right along the bayfront. Okay. So if I walk in the doors for the first time, walk me through what's going to happen at my first visit. Sure. So what happens is we bring uh, groups of families together for what we call a session. I don't like to use a lot of the, the terminology that we use, but a session is 10 meetings. And so the families will meet together 10 times. And when they come in, they'll be greeted by a volunteer. It's always the same volunteer who are in the group. So we have a volunteer greeter who will help them um, get acclimated to the, to the building. And then we have the families are there for about two hours. Okay. And during the first hour, we have dinner for the families. And it's basically a community time. There'll, there'll be about um, anywhere from 50 to 80 family members that come on a group night. Really? So typically the groups are, are rather large. Okay. And, um, and we provide dinner for everybody. And during that first hour, we play games. We have an air hockey room and a lot of board games and different things. And everybody just kind of hangs out that first hour and, and just kind of transitions from school and work and everything that was happening outside. And then during the second hour, we divide the kids according to age. So we have um, four different group rooms in our facility, a preschool room, elementary, middle, and high school. And we divide the kids according to age so they're now with their peers, right? They're with kids their age because a 16-year-old's going to grieve very differently than a six-year-old, right? And so the discussions and the activities that we do in the different, um, in the different rooms are age appropriate, so they're different depending on what well, how old the kids are. And so in those group rooms, then the kids have the opportunity, the volunteers will work with them to do a variety of activities that will help them talk about their feelings, talk about what happened, talk about, you know, what we talked, um, maybe something like feeling like they have to grow up very quickly and take on um, a more grown up role in the family. Um, a lot of times they're feeling very guilty, a lot of anger, uh, lots of feelings that come along with grief. They have the opportunity to express those feelings and also share the memories of the person who died, right. which is vital. It's very, very important. And, and oftentimes outside of the caring place, that's not happening because people are afraid to ask. They're afraid of upsetting the child. Exactly. You know, don't mention the person's yeah, don't name. Talk don't talk it. about it. Don't talk about it. And so they don't get the opportunity to talk about the person that they love who mm -hmm. died. And that's really what they have left are those memories. That's right. And I think it's great that they have a place that they can go to and they can talk about that because honestly, as an individual, it, you meet someone who has lost their child or... Uh, has lost a spouse. Me as an individual, I don't know what to say. Right. Do I bring it up? Mm -hmm. am, I, am I going to bring memories and, and make them cry? Am I going to upset them? Right. But then on the other hand, people are saying, no, it's like this person never existed. No right. one will even talk to me about them. That's exactly right. And that's compounded when it's a child. I would because imagine. Because the last thing we want to do is, is make a child cry. Exactly. And so right. everybody avoids it. And everybody thinks that that child is bouncing back very quickly because a child grieves very differently than a, an adult. Mm -hmm. Their grief looks very different. And so, you know, kind of back to what we were saying before, that child might be outside playing baseball. They might be going to school. They might be doing all the things that they need to do. And so you look at them and you think, you think oh, they're fine. But, um, but children grieve very differently. You know, where an adult 
can kind of stay with the grief and, um, and cognitively be able to, to talk about it for long periods of time. They might be able to sit down like you and I are and have a discussion uh, for a half hour about that person. Right. A child can't do that. Mm -hmm. They grieve in, in small spurts. And so while they might be outside playing with their friends, that night they might be crying themselves to sleep. And, um, or they might have a, a moment with their mom in the house after their dad dies and then go outside like nothing else happened, mm -hmm. like nothing's ever happened. So it looks like they're bouncing back, but that's just how children grief, grieve differently than adults. And don't you think too, um, with, with, with the grieving process with children too, they, like we were saying, they're so afraid to, to rock the boat, but I think most of all, they don't know what's right and wrong. Mm -hmm. Come on, we're adults. We've read books, the 10 steps of grieving and how right. to get over everything. So we're aware that we're gonna have a multitude of emotions. Absolutely. Kids don't realize that that's what's gonna happen to them. They don't, and there's so much that happens when you're grieving, and, and for kids it can mm -hmm. be very scary. And, and think about it for us, Judy, as adults. Oftentimes, we don't know, well, you just said, you don't know what to say, you don't know, you know. I do this for a living, and sometimes I find myself driving to a, a, a viewing at a funeral home, thinking, "What am I going to say?" Exactly. Right. And so, um, even their own their own peers, mm -hmm. they don't know. Right. You know, they're 10, 11, 12 years old. Mm -hmm. They don't know how to no. how to support their friend no. who's just had this happen. Mm -mm. We as adults don't even know how to right. do that. So, it, it's hard for them. Yeah. So, the children's grief is a, is a big thing, which brings us to. Um, an event or a program or whatever you might want to call it that mm -hmm. uh, we want to talk about, and it's uh, Children's Grief Awareness Day. Right. Tell me about that, Therese. So Children's Grief Awareness Day is a day that the Highmark Caring Place created eight or nine years ago um, to help raise awareness of all of the things that we've just been talking about, to help people understand what it means to be a child who has had somebody that they love die. And um, actually, I, I'm proud to say that the idea for Children's Grief Awareness Day actually came from a, uh, from a group of students in an Erie School District. Really? Here. We do a lot of a lot of work within schools. Okay. And um, and one, one time we were working with the schools and the students said, why isn't there a day for this? You know, there's, you know, like there's many days for like breast cancer awareness and, and lots of different medical issues. Yes. You know, wear red for heart, um, to raise awareness about heart issues, that type of thing. But there's nothing, so the kids were saying, why isn't there a day? And um, so my staff member came back to me and said, you know, they had this idea and I thought, why isn't there, you know, um, from the mouth of, of babes sometimes. Exactly. I can't believe we hadn't thought about this before. So it's wonderful that, that this idea came from, um, from students here, right in Erie, right here in Erie. And so what it is, is it's a day just like other awareness days to help raise raise awareness of the of the issue of what it means to be a grieving child mm -hmm. but the the impact of death on children and their need for support and um, and so it's it started very locally but right here in Erie and then became kind of regional and statewide for a couple of years and over the last eight years it's grown actually into an international day of awareness has it really and it, it started has. right here right here in Erie with an idea yes. from some students it's wonderful it's 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 national, it's across the United States, and then in the last couple of years, we've had involvement from uh, grief support programs in the UK, in Japan, in Canada, and in other um, international programs. Wow. Mm -hmm. Now, um, okay, we know, it, all right, there's going to be a Children's Grief Awareness Day. When is that? So it's always observed on the third Thursday in November. Okay. So it's typically the Thursday right before Thanksgiving. And we picked that time of year specifically because, um, no surprise, the holidays are a very difficult time no. for um, for kids and ah, for families. Exactly. And so, you know, we picked that time of year very right. purposefully to um, to kind of mark that and help raise the awareness around that as well about how hard the holidays are for um, for kids and families. And and during this day, at least, you know, the kids can get, get some extra support right at a time when they need it. Okay, what can we do to help uh, observe uh, Awareness Day? So, one very simple thing that everybody can do on that day, and if, um, by the way, if in, no, in 2016, the date is November 17th. Okay. So it's November 17th of 2016, and on that day, something very simple is we ask everybody to wear blue, 
All right. So kind of the color that symbolizes that day is mm -hmm. blue. And um, we have actually, if you uh, go on our website, or there's a, a website, childrensgriefawarenessday.com. Okay. And we have a lot of different ideas and activities on there that can, whether you're an individual or whether you're a, an organization or a company that wants to do something. Mm -hmm. You know, we've had a lot of businesses that that day will, um, will just blew out their business. You know, they'll have a lot of maybe blue balloons or just a lot of blue decorations, right. but then also have um, information available that you can get off of our website to help raise awareness um, about this issue. Now, why is it so important to raise awareness? Because the kids are hurting and they need help. Mm -hmm. And you can't, it's not like a physical issue where you can tell if a child has a broken leg or if, if they have diabetes typically. Although sometimes with diabetes you can't tell. But right. um, you know, with a more physical issue, you can look at a child and know. But mm -hmm. oftentimes with a, a child who's grieving, you can't tell by looking at them. Mm -hmm. and, and for all the reasons we talked about earlier, it changes so much for them. And they're hurting in so many ways that we as adults don't realize. Okay. And it's really important for people to understand um, all, the, all the ways that these kids are hurting, you know, all the, the questions that, they, have, that mm -hmm. they ask. Why me? Why did this have to happen to me? Why my dad? My best friend still has their dad. Why did this have to happen to me? Did I do something wrong? Is God mad at me? Um, could I have done something different? I was just talking to a, a teenager the other day who, um, she was with, her dad was sick for a while and she was with her dad toward the end, caring for him every day. Mm -hmm. She left to go get to McDonald's, five minutes from, from the house, get something to eat. In that time, her dad died. Oh, geez. So she wasn't with him in his final moments. And that was a couple of years ago. She still carries the guilt of that and of not being with him toward the end. So just so many things that we don't think about that these kids are struggling with. <clears throat> and they struggle with them for a while, too. They do. It's not like, well, they'll come to, you know, a, a few sessions there and mm -hmm. they're cured. I mean, this is something that has scarred them. So what you are teaching them to do is how to deal with this pain. Right. Because you're going to have pain. Exactly. I mean, you just can't escape it. And, you and you are going to be hurting. So how do you deal with it? Exactly. We're helping them learn how to cope and to integrate the mm -hmm. death into their life because it's not going to go away. Right. You know, if they're 10 when their mom dies, when they're now 16 mm -hmm. and they're a teenager and, you know, you need your mom yes. at that point yes. in time. So they understand the death differently at 16 mm -hmm. than when they're married. And, you know, just lots of life life milestones that if your sister, your grandmother, your, your parent isn't mm -hmm. there with you, the grief right. comes back. So yeah. it's a lifelong struggle. So we try to teach them some skills and, and give them the opportunity to learn how to cope with it. You do a wonderful job. You really do, Teresa. You. And, you know, I've always... Uh, thought so much, and I love promoting um, the Highmark Children's Place. I really do. Thank you. But um, you mentioned volunteers. Mm -hmm. Now, it sounds to me like your organization is so dependent on volunteers. Absolutely. If one of our viewers is out there and, and they want to help out, how can they get a hold of someone to volunteer? The and is there something for everybody, let's put it that way. Absolutely, a lot of people think you, might, you must have to have a counseling background right. or something, which you don't. Okay. All of our volunteers come from every walk of life. All right. We provide the training, all you have to do is give us a call, mm -hmm. and uh, we are very dependent on volunteers. We're a very small staff, and, um, and we need volunteers all the time. So there's, there's lots of different roles that the volunteers can play. If mm -hmm. they're not comfortable with kids, or even with the adults, there's mm -hmm. many different things that they can do to help our organization. And I did want to help everybody understand, because it's vital, that everything we offer is at no cost. So, and, and it's because yeah. of, the, that, of the help of the volunteers that right. we can do that. But our programming is, is available to anybody in the community at no cost. I think it is absolutely a wonderful program. You do a great job. You really fulfill a need. And sadly, like you said, it's not until you're put in that position right. to realize that, that you have that need. But thank you for being on the program today. Thank you for being right in our own backyard. I mean, I, I guess people just don't realize yes. what we have here. Even if you don't have need for their services, maybe you want to volunteer. You know, give them a hand, give them any little time that, that you'd be able to. It really would 
It would help. Help out. Absolutely. Definitely. And even if you personally don't have a need, somebody you know exactly. might. Exactly. So if you can spread the word to somebody who might need it. And there you go. That's helping too. Mm -hmm. If uh, anybody has any questions or needs a little bit more information, Therese, uh, how can they get this I information? I think the best way to get in contact with us is through our website, so highmarkcaringplace.com. All of our contact information is on there, our address, our phone numbers. Okay. And we have four sites in Pennsylvania, so, you know, if you have a need for something somewhere else, it's all on there. Okay. Thank you again for joining you, us. Judy. It's always a pleasure to have you on the show. Thank you. Viewers, if you're interested in volunteering or getting more information, please feel free to check out their website. Thank you for tuning into the Milker Government Channel. Until next time, have a wonderful day. You're watching the Mill Creek Government Channel, powered by WQLN Public Media.